Well, this morning, as we move into the sermon, you know, we're continuing in our sermon series entitled Living Hope. Um, and if you've been with us, we've been walking through the New Testament book of First Peter. And in the beginning of that letter in the New Testament, like Peter writes uh, to these Christians who are scattered, who are in exile. And he says to them that by, by, the, by God's great mercy, that they have been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right, and this living hope has given them this. I mean, this new birth has given them a new family, and this new family has given them new relationships and a new way of living. And this letter speaks to what it means to live in light of that, to live in light of the grace of God, this grace that is undeserved gift that, as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we're given a new life, a new family, and a new eternal standing before God. A living hope, a hope that never dies. Despite all the circumstances that change in this world, that living hope is kept in heaven and it will neither perish, spoil, or fade. And so this letter talks about what it means to live in light of that living hope. Uh, and as we move forward to verses, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, here Peter says, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, he urges uh, these early Christians to abstain from sinful desires, meaning Though there's desires that are full of sin and selfishness, he says, abstain from them, stay away from them. And then he says, live such good lives among the pagans, right? That they may accuse you of doing wrong, that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, that they would actually see their good deeds and give glory to God, right? These words are what set up all the verses, at least that we've considered since that day. And, and it sets up the verses we're going to consider today. That Peter's saying, look, in, in light of where you're living and the relationships in which you are and in the pagan world that you're in, live such good lives among others so that they see your good deeds. The assumption is that others are watching, right? The assumption is that others need help. They're looking for help. They're looking for answers. And ultimately, they're looking for hope. Peter says, we have a living hope in Christ. And let's show them that living hope by how we live and who we are. And so this morning, we're going to continue with, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And I'm going to read those verses to you and invite you to really take these in uh, and consider what they mean for your life and for our shared life together as followers of Christ. Chapter 3, verses 13, we read this. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now listen to this summary here, right? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. All right, this is the word of God. Um, so Peter begins with this question, right? This great question of, of, he asks, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? In essence, he's saying, look, if you do good, who's going to harm you? Now, the answer should be no one, but Peter knows that as they live differently, as they live good, according to what God describes as good, maybe not what the world describes as good, that pe the people at that time were going to see a difference in these early Christians, and that at points they would, they would think that they're odd, strange, weird, out of place. And in fact, because of that, there would be persecution and suffering because they were unlike the people of that time. And so Peter acknowledges and recognizes and anticipates that people will actually you know, cause people to suffer for doing good. But he gives these, these words of encouragement. He says, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Right? Words from the Old Testament. In essence, saying stick with it. No matter what, do the right thing. 
in spite of potential suffering, in spite of potential struggles, do the right thing. As you think about your life, have you ever had a time in your life where you, you stepped up for someone else or you did what was right and then suffered because of it? Right? Was there a time when you knew something was wrong and you thought, man, I, I, I need to step up and step into something? Or maybe you saw someone else do that. You know, as I think about my life, one of the first times that, that one of the first memories that comes to mind, and I might have shared this years ago in a sermon, was when I was in eighth grade. I was, I clearly remember I was at lunch and, um, and a friend of mine who was in my youth group, he was in seventh grade. He was actually the pastor's son. He had just moved from California right to New Jersey. He felt out of place and he didn't have any friends. And, and as he was walking through the cafeteria, friends at my table started making fun of him. And because he was my friend from youth group. I had a choice. I'm like, do I step up? Do I say something or do I remain quiet? Well, I remember saying, you know, turning to uh, the guy across the way and said, hey, you need to be quiet. And uh, the guy, my, the person who's sitting across from me at the table said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I remember I um, had a bag of Fritos, much like this. And uh, I said, here's what I'm going to do about it. I said, I flicked the Frito off his face. Maybe not the best decision. And he said, oh, so he took his napkin and he threw a napkin back at me. Well, I took the bag of Fritos and I tossed it at him. What well, happened to be sloppy Joe day, right? And so my friend across had a plate of sloppy Joe. He picked up the plate and dumped it all over me. I just remember sloppy Joe, it hit me. It splattered, it went everywhere. It went on my friend on my left and friend of the right. And then chaos broke out. People started yelling food fight. My friend next to me like picked up the table and dropped it down and yelled food fight. Everyone just started throwing stuff everywhere. Eventually, uh, the vice principal came into the cafeteria and said, cut it out. And as he looked around, he called me forward. He said, Jeff, come up here. And in front of everyone, I, I'll never forget this quote. The vice principal said, if you act like an animal, we're going to treat you like an animal. Go up to the principal's office. Everyone goes, ooh, right? And so I walked up to the, uh, to the principal's office, and I'm embarrassed to say that I was given an out-of-school suspension for a day uh, for starting that food fight. And uh, even though I remember getting in the car and going home and, and just feeling, you know, feeling horrible that I got suspended, but at the same time, I didn't feel horrible for stepping up for my friend Dan. Um, now, is that something I recommend? Do I recommend starting food fights? Absolutely not. Uh, but I knew I needed to say something in that moment. And because I did, there was a form of suffering. In fact, it was, it was a mess. And I was a mess for it. I think that's a little bit what Peter's getting at here. He's like, look, if you are going to step up in the midst of, of doing something good, you may get yourself into a mess. And it's going to come in the form of a kind of suffering. He's like, there's a blessing in that suffering, though, um, as you do. And so he says to do good. Now, is there a general sense of doing good? Is, do we just kind of figure out what it means to, to do good or not do good? No, here we read in, in verse 15, he, Peter says, but in your hearts, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Or he's saying, right, in the hearts, in the core of your being, right, in the very core of who you are that then, and Jesus taught, he says, out of your heart, the mouth speaks, right? In essence, out of your heart, that's how you act, right? So he's saying that, it, he's like, look, in your, in, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. At the center of your being, ensure that he is Lord, that he's the one making the calls, that he is the one who is setting the pace of your life, that you live in obedience and faithfulness to him. He's like, revere, re have reverence for Christ as Lord, right? And therefore, follow his commands, follow his teachings, right? We don't have to come up with a general sense of what's good and not good, that God has given us Jesus. He's given us his word and his teachings and all of the Bible to tell us what's right and what's wrong. I mean, later in verse 16, we read, it says, to, he says to do, he talks about good behavior in Christ, right? Not good behavior in general, but good behavior based on God, based on Christ and his voice and his word. Right, and as we, what's, what's the outcome? Well, as we have good behavior in Christ, it should bring about questions. I'll never forget Michael Frost, right, author, and, and uh, he was speaking at a, at a Christian conference years ago, and he gave a talk called Live Questionable Lives. Live questionable lives, lives that, that others 
will look and say, I don't understand what's going on. Like, why are they living in that way? And then question their life. He says, live in such a manner. Peter anticipates this. He says, right, in, in the second part of verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Right? Peter's anticipating if you live differently, if you do what's good and right according to Christ, that people are going to ask questions. In essence, it's a different way of saying you have a questionable life, not negatively, but positively. Right? Peter says, so therefore, give a reason, give an answer um, for your life. And he said, how do you give that answer? Do you give it by shoving it in people's face? Do you give it by screaming on social media? He says, no, do it with gentleness and respect. And he says, and do it with a clear conscience. Now, with a clear conscience is important because our conscience is a, is a gift from God. And our conscience is, you know, with the Holy Spirit can alert us that we've done something wrong and that when we have that sense of guilt, it's a gift that says we're heading in the wrong direction. And so that conscience needs to be, in essence, programmed and shaped by God's word. And he says, if you do it with a good conscience, if you do it according to God's word, it's like, that's the recommended approach for how to give a response. And you can give it with a good conscience if you know you're standing on the word of God. And so here we see Peter saying you know, to, to, to live well, to do good, and to have good behavior in Christ based on God's word, um, to love God, to love your neighbor, to love your enemy. Right? This is the way of Jesus. We're called to love like Jesus. And we're called to point to Jesus then when people ask. And so over all this, as we look at verse 18, you know, Peter really brings this to a head. He says, for Christ also suffered for sins, right? The righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. Right here, after talking about good behavior and suffering, he says, look, as you think about your life, you think about the potential suffering that comes from doing good and, and act, living differently in this world. He's like, remember Jesus. Remember his suffering. Remember what he went through. Right? He suffered once. Right, He was righteous. He never did anything wrong. He never sinned. He was perfect. The righteous for the unrighteous. Us, you, me, all of us who have sinned. None of us are perfect. Right here is a summary of the gospel. Right, that though we deserve the penalty to have, we deserve to have to pay the penalty because of our sin for breaking God's laws. Right, every time you break a law, you have to pay a penalty, and that penalty is is a broken relationship with God and separation from God forever. That Jesus suffered once for us, right? The righteous, He and the righteous for us, the unrighteous. Why? To bring us to God. Right, He stood in our place. He was that sacrifice. And he paid the penalty that we deserved so that we could then be brought to God. It's this incredible, incredible good news of the gospel. And it's an incredible picture of salvation. It's a picture of reconciliation, right? God reconciled us, right? That broken relationship. He made the way for us to be reconciled. In essence, to be restored into a right relationship with him forever. And this reconciliation is not just between us and God. It's not just a me and Jesus situation. The promise of God is the gospel's bigger. It also points to a greater reconciliation, not just between us and God, but also between us and other people. And that because of that, God promises to a supernatural work of reconciliation and restoration with others as well. And in doing so, then when people see that, something that we cannot do on our own strength or make happen with our own, like, own resources, people are going to start to ask questions and wonder what's different. Because um, God has given us this work of reconciliation. We see that in, in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians, right? Here, we, after reading 1 Peter, we see that, God, that, we, that Christ died to bring us to God and to reconcile us. Well, God has given us a bigger task. And so in, verse, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, we read this. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And here's a memorable verse that is there. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new has come or the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself 
through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And here in verse 21, very similar to what we read in 1 Peter, right? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here, a very similar message, right? The Apostle Paul is saying something similar. He's like, look, when you look at people in the world, don't look at them through a, in a worldly way, through a worldly perspective. See them like God sees them, through the lens of Christ. Right? No longer look at them just like the rest of the world looks at them. And then he says, you know, because you've been given a new birth, right? He says, if anyone's a new creation, right? A new creation is, leads to a new birth, again, which is, leads to a new family and a new way of living. And this new way of living a new way of and a new family involves the work of reconciliation. What Paul calls the ministry of reconciliation. It's an act of service. And we're called God's ambassadors in this. Because God became, you know, he suffered for us. He came and suffered with us and he suffered for us. So we could become this new family in Christ. You know, as Charvin shared about briefly last week from Ephesians 2, he talked about the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, and I don't have time to read the entire section again, um, but I think I just want to read the first couple words of, of chapter 2, verse 14. It says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, here's a bigger picture, right? Jesus didn't come just to save us to go to heaven though he did that for us. Jesus also came to save us from ourselves and all of our broken relationships. And he's given us this ministry of reconciliation, right? To, to be reconciled to one another, ultimately because that points to God himself, who's the one who reconciles, right? God has called together all kinds of people um, to be a part of this ministry of reconciliation. And we think about Jesus, I'm gonna try and connect some dots here for you. Remember this, Jesus, as we considered last week, he got uncomfortable for our sake, right? Jesus left the comforts of heaven to come to be uncomfortable with us and for us, right? Jesus sacrificed everything. Remember, sacrifice means to give up something for the sake of other. And Jesus sacrificed comfort to be with us for our salvation, to form the new family of Jesus, the people of God. And um, the other sacrifice not only is comforts, but to give up comfort, but to give up anything that protects that comfort if it hurts others or stands in the way of God. So as we think about all these things, how do we bring this down to real life? How do we bring this down to what's happening in our country right now? You know, I shared some in a, an email yesterday to the, our church family, some of the considerations that I've been going through as I've been praying and listening and discerning in light of all that's happening around our countries. We think about the wrongful deaths of Ahmad Arbery in Georgia and Breonna Taylor, right, in Kentucky. And of course, George Floyd in Minnesota, right? There's been all kinds of responses and reactions to these deaths, right? All kinds of emotions, all kinds of responses, all kinds of reactions. I mean, if you're like me, you're going through some soul searching right now. I pray that you are, that you're not just looking at this and, and just casting it aside, but that you, that you are doing some soul searching in this time, asking questions like I'm asking, what do I believe? And why do I believe it? I think all of us owe that to God, owe that to ourselves, and owe that to others. Ask the question, what do I believe? And why do I believe it? And with that, how does Jesus intersect with all of this? Like, really, how does Jesus intersect with it? Because as we read in 1 Peter 3.15, we're called to, to revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. Right? And so that means we need to have Christ as Lord. He's the one who needs to be telling us what to do 
And he needs to be the voice that we're listening to in terms of how we see, interpret, and respond to the events that are happening, right? Not what our friends are ultimately telling us, not what we're reading on social media, or not what a news channel is telling us, or not even what our family may have told us growing up. But if Christ is Lord in our lives, then his word and his voice need to be showing us how we are to respond during this uncertain and tumultuous time. I want to share a little bit of my story this morning uh, as a beginning um, to really consider, to maybe invite you to consider your story as you are looking at what's happening in our world and country right now. You know, my first experience um, maybe of racism came when I was in elementary school. Many of you know I'm half Chinese. I may not look Chinese to some people. It's funny. Some people say I look Chinese. Other people say I don't look Chinese at all. Other people say I look Hawaiian. I've heard all kinds of comments, but at least in elementary school, when I grew up in a town, which was mostly Caucasian, I looked different. And I remember I could picture where I was on a playground where uh, a couple guys uh, called me a racial slur. I won't repeat what it was. Um, and they made fun of my eyes and they put on some type of Asian accent um, and made fun of me. And I don't know if I ever felt more alone. And no one stood up for me. Everyone, I just remember seeing like everyone just left. And I didn't know what to do with that. Um, I remember going home and talking to my parents about it, um, but I didn't know what to do with it. And you would have think you would have thought that that experience would have stuck with me, that it would have given me some form of compassion for others who were going through that. But it didn't go that way. Um, in fact, it went the other way, where all of a sudden, when I saw differences in others, instead of me coming to their side or having compassion for them based on what I experienced, because that wasn't the only time I had that experience, by the way, that I then said, instead of people looking at me and saying, look, Jeff looks different, then I'm going to point the finger at others. And as long as the spotlight is on someone else because they're different, then the spotlight's not on me, right? And so from that, over the years, then picking up you know, different themes that seeped into my life, themes about other races. Um, in terms of the value and worth of other people. Maybe not something I would have consciously or explicitly said out loud, but really seeped into my heart and became working assumptions about other people. I mean, specifically black or African-American people. And in this season, um, maybe for the first time in my life, I'm stepping back to ask some questions. And I invite you to ask these questions as well. Questions like, what if? What if what I've been assuming or what others have told me is not completely correct? What if everything that I've been taking in maybe from one news channel over the years or from one set of opinions is not completely true? It's a dangerous question to ask. It's an uncomfortable place to go, but I believe we're all called to ask the question, what if? Another question I love to ask to God is, what am I missing? What am I missing? God, my prayer is, God, you see everything. You know everything. I have my biases. I have my experiences. I have my hurt and my pain. I have my sin. Lord, what am I missing? And so in this season, I'm entering into a renewed, or maybe for the first time, a new season of prayer and discernment around the questions of race and racism. I'm not sure where this is going to go. Even this week, um, I've been trying to bring everything to God to bring it to light. And I'm more convinced than ever that in this COVID-19 season, where I'm worn down, all of us are worn down in different capacities. And we know that there is no normal to go back to. I believe wholeheartedly in the season that God is at work. And, and it's a season where we and I could ask questions that we may have never asked before. And we ask God those questions. Perhaps he'll lead us to different conclusions than we've held on to most of, if not our whole lives. You know, last uh, week, Charvin challenged us to get uncomfortable. And I heard that challenge and already through some, some other friends um, and reading someone's Facebook post, I felt like I needed to reach out to someone. Um, as a friend from seminary, a black pastor up in Alexandria, and I reached out and gave him a phone call last week. And I'm glad I did. It was a great phone call. 
In fact, I simply asked, I said, tell me, how, how, um, how are you doing? What are you feeling? What are you seeing? What are you going through? And I was quiet. Right, James 1.19, where we read, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It was hard to put that verse into practice, right? To be quick to listen and slow to speak. There's so many things I want to say, but, 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 but I let him talk on his own terms and to hear his perspective. And there's some perspectives I had not considered or things that maybe I had heard and thought, truly, that can't be the case. But from his perspective, his life story, and echoed by a couple other conversations this past week, they've been true. And so I'm asking the question, God, what if, what if what I've been assuming is not correct? What am I missing, God? This is the beginning of that process. Um, as some of you know, I, I posted on Facebook, I, there was a, a prayer gathering of pastors on Thursday night. It was put together by this group called Four Richmond, which brings pastors and churches in the Richmond area together. We gathered on Monument Avenue, two blocks away from the Robert E. Lee statue to pray. And then we walked to Monroe Park, where uh, the protesters each night gather in Monroe Park. And at 630, there was a time um, where the protest was going to begin and there was going to be a march. And uh, we were there simply to listen and be present. I had no idea that the organizer of the protesters was going to stand up and begin by saying, as we as we start tonight, everyone needs to know that there is a group of pastors who are here tonight from all around the Richmond area, and they're here to listen. Um, man, and the crowd went crazy. And what I didn't know then was that uh, that same or that person organizing invited up one of the pastors, a black pastor from within Richmond who led the group in prayer. And as he prayed um, and spoke to uh, and pointed people to Christ. When he finished that prayer within the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, I didn't know how people were going to react. I thought, would there be booze? Would people be quiet? People erupted in cheers. Now, look, we're not here looking for cheers from people, but what I heard in that, when that cheering was that they realized maybe God is in this too. And so what did I do? I had a choice. I could have gone home, but I decided to walk with the protest. You want to talk about getting uncomfortable? That was uncomfortable because um, we walked for a long time. And as I was walking, my prayer was, God, help me to hear. Help me to listen. What am I missing? And what I heard were cries, cries of hurt, cries of pain. A lot of the cries and things that were said, I didn't agree with. But much like when there's others who are hurting and you don't try and correct them right away, but you simply listen. I was there simply to listen, to hear what they had to say. They didn't even know I was listening, but it was super helpful to be there, and it was uncomfortable, and much like a food fight in eighth grade, it was messy. It was messy, but the word compassion means to literally to suffer with another person, and I feel like that was the first step for me, and as we consider what this means for all of us, um, I want to give us some biblical considerations in terms of what God's been showing me and how he's been shaping my heart and mind through scripture. Some of these I shared in the email yesterday. I'm just going to walk through some this morning as we finish up. A couple of things. One, the reminder that we are all created in the image of God, right? Genesis 1, 27. And because we're all created in the image of God and we were created good, right? In the beginning, there was, there was perfect peace. There was perfect relationship with God and perfect relationship with one another. And it's the Old Testament biblical word of, of shalom, which means peace, not just the absence of conflict, but flourishing and wholeness. And that's the way it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be shalom. As we were created in the image of God, we were created to be in relationship with him and relationship with others. But then sin entered the world. And because of sin came brokenness, a broken relationship with God and broken relationships with one another. And that shalom was broken and smashed. And we know this, we live in a broken and sin impacted world. The world is broken. We see that everywhere we look. And this includes our relationships. And so this broken world includes contempt for differences. As I continue to look at the idea of race and different people, right? There's, in our sin, there's, there's a contempt for those who are different than us. Whether it's because we get that generally, if people have different opinions or they act differently. But we've seen throughout human history, if there's a difference in skin color or a difference in a way of life, there's contempt. 
And alongside that contempt typically is fueled by pride, right? Pride, which is not a good thing in the Bible. Typically, it's the pride of sin, where it's not saying I'm good or we are good, but it's saying I am better or we are better than others, right? The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, 3 says, look, remember, in humility, value others better than yourselves, right? This is the way of Christ, right? He's pushing against pride. You know, as we think about how this impacts us individually and personally, I've had to ask questions of myself. How, am I, how, how have I done this? How have I let contempt enter into my life for other people, especially those of a different skin color? How have the opinions and thoughts that have been handed to me, whether, again, through friends or through social media or, or, or news channels or even family, how has that fed into that contempt for others? And is that the way of Jesus? Is that having him as the Lord of my life? Or is that having other voices be the Lord of my life? It's an uncomfortable question. An uncomfortable question for me that, honestly, it's a lot easier not to ask. And there's a part of me that just wants to go back to normal before the pandemic, before all this, this discussion and this sermon about race. Let's just go back to normal and not think about it. It's a lot easier. But that's not, God where has, that's not where God has me. I don't think that's where God has us. Because I know it's impacted me individually. And then the tougher question is, and this is, a, this is one that's a lightning rod, if it impacts us individually, then logically it impacts us collectively and the systems in which we find ourselves. And the idea of systemic racism is, is I know, is a hot topic. What does that look like? What does that mean? For all of us, including me, I, we have to ask the question, what if? What if the assumptions we've had aren't correct? What, and ask God, what are we missing? So I'm entering into that dialogue with God. I want to enter into that dialogue with you as a church family. I want us to enter into that dialogue with others who are different than us. That will make us uncomfortable. That will call into question our lives and assumptions. If, if this is God's way of convicting us of sin, if this is God's way of shining light on an area of us that we are unfaithful and disobedient to God himself, then that's a great thing. And I'm open to it. And I pray and ask that you would be open to it as well. Already, some of you may have been like, I want to turn this off or click it off. Maybe you've, some of you have already clicked it off and you've come back later to see the end of this. That's okay. All of us are on a journey. All of us are in process. For me, I just feel like I'm starting this process or maybe restarting a process that was false started many times over my life. I invite you onto this journey with me to pray and consider what if and what am I missing? Right, the, for all this, we think about the vision of worship in Revelation 7. Right in the final book of the Bible, a vision given to one of Jesus' closest friends, John, right in the middle of this vision, we read this in Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Here's a picture, all right, of, of worship. And this is uh, the end picture, when we are all together. And if this is how it's going to be for all eternity, I believe God's calling us to begin putting that into practice right now. And this begins with reconciliation. It begins with restoration. And it begins by letting God into parts of our lives that we may have not let him in before. So what are some steps of consideration in this? What are some action steps, some ways of response? First is to join in with lament, prayer, and fasting. So again, I invite you tomorrow to commit tomorrow to a day of prayer. Some of you for a day of fasting, whether one meal, two meals, or fast from something to create space for God, and then to join in lament. There's a prayer time again at noon and 7 p.m. on Zoom. We'd love for you to join us in those prayer times. Another way to respond is to pray and to seek to be people of compassion, right? To suffer with others. Can we consider early on in 1 Peter how Jesus he came to suffer with us and for us. And he calls us to go and suffer with others for others. That's compassion, right? To seek a heart of compassion. And how do we get there? It begins with confession and repentance. And ask God, what am I missing? And in Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart. See if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As we pray that prayer and God brings to light those areas of sin and those areas of racism, 
those areas of contempt and pride, that we could then give that over to God. And as we confess, he'll cleanse us of that sin, reshape our hearts, and give us that repentance, that change of mind and change of direction over time. The next way to respond is seek out conversations. And I was challenged last week to do it. I'm going to keep seeking to reach out to others who are different than me and think differently than me and have different life experiences. It's uncomfortable. But God's calling us to get uncomfortable for the sake of others. And so who is, is there a person that you could contact this week and simply call them and say, how are you doing? Tell me more what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're seeing, and then simply listen. And then from there to take action. Um, some of you may be down the line. If it is to take action, actions of compassion or humility and listening like I talked about, or if God leads you even to speak up, to speak up in person, speak up even on social media in a responsible way, to speak up. As you feel led, recognizing that not all of us are in the same place. Some of you are way down the line on this, and you're thinking, we should have been talking about this years ago. Others are like, this is the last thing on earth I ever want to talk about. But let's all bring this before God into his loving light where he will show us what's best and what to do. Over all this, um, I'm asking, what needs to die in me? What are some working assumptions that need to die in me that are not of God so that new life can rise up? That's a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of God's work in our lives individually and together. I know this is a lot. Um, I wasn't even sure if I could even share this or how I would share it. Um, it was, and like I said in the email yesterday, part of me didn't want to because I know I was going to say something that didn't, wasn't going to come out right. But I take heart in this. I'll finish with this. One of our dear church members, Faye Giles, right? A dear woman of great wisdom on our prayer call on Wednesday, she said this. She said, every generation needs to engage this topic. Every generation needs to engage this topic. And so some of you, you've engaged this, you've entered into it, and you've wrestled with it. You have wisdom for us. I need to hear it. Others need to hear it. For some, you are engaging this for the first time. You have great energy around it, you have, and you want to know more. We need both in a multi-generational church to come together. So this week, we're going to look for ways to meet on Zoom to talk about this. Uh, and I need your help, and we need one another as we seek to discern what is God's will for us in this specific topic. Uh, let me pray for us as we finish. I look forward to the conversation. I know this is just the beginning. Uh, thank you for listening. I know we've gone long, but um, it's an important topic and an important time. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh Lord God, we need your help. Lord, as your followers, as followers of Christ, help us in our hearts to revere Christ as Lord. And as we do, Lord, that we would base more and more our lives, our perspectives, our working assumptions on his voice and not the voice of others. Oh Lord, we ask that you would shine your light on our lives. Show us, Lord, where we have sinned against you and sinned against others in these matters. Lord, move us to a place of confession. Help us, God, to repent and to turn and to change. God, you know our stories. You know the right, right sequence and the right approach for this. Lord, I ask and pray for every person who's part of this prayer right now or as part of this prayer later when they watch it on this Facebook Live, God, that you would meet them where they are with your love and truth and lead them forward. Oh God, we need your mercy. We need your wisdom. We need your help. We commit ourselves to you, to you alone, King of Kings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.